Hello and welcome. The scriptures teach that man must cooperate with God in his salvation. Though Calvinists take exception to this saying that salvation is wholly the work of God, that man is required to do nothing for his salvation, that God does it all for him, the Holy Spirit says otherwise. This is evident from the fact that Whenever the sinners asked, what must we do to be saved? Gospel preachers always responded by telling them something to do. If sinners, for example, asked as unbelievers, they were told to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in Acts 16, 30 and 31. If they asked as believers, they were told to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, as we see in Acts 2, 36 through 38. And if they asked as penitent believers, well, they were told to be baptized and wash away their sins, as we are told in Acts 22 and in verse 16. And furthermore, their cooperation with God for their salvation did not end at their conversion. Writing to the Christians at Philippi, the Apostle Paul admonishes them to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. The Bible most certainly teaches that men cooperate with God in their own salvation. However, a major reason why Calvinists reject synergism, even though it is taught in the scriptures, is because there they believe in the doctrine of total hereditary depravity. A long, long expression, funny sounding doctrine, but it's a serious doctrine taught by these people. Let them tell us what this doctrine means. In the words of the larger catechism, question 25, we read this statement. Wherein consisteth the sinfulness of that estate wherein two man fell? Answer. The sinfulness of that estate wherein two man fell consisteth in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of that righteousness wherein he was created, and the corruption of his nature, whereby he is utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite unto all that is spiritually good and holy, inclined to all evil and that continually which is commonly called original sin, and from which do proceed all actual transgression. And so according to this doctrine, each person inherits from Adam a nature that is not simply opposed to some good, but to all good. Not simply inclined to some evil, but all evil. Not simply inclined, but wholly inclined to all evil. Not simply inclined to evil sometimes, but wholly inclined to all evil and that continually. If this doctrine is true, then it has infants possessing the nature that is as bad as the devil. You doubt this? Well, let me then ask the question. If it is true that the disposition of the human spirit at conception is utterly indisposed, disabled and made opposite unto all that is spiritually good, and wholly inclined to all evil and that continually, how can the devil be any worse? Can he be more than utterly indisposed, disabled, made opposite unto all that is spiritually good and wholly inclined to all evil? Listen, dear friends, one cannot be more than that. He cannot be worse than utterly indisposed unto all that is spiritually good. One can never be more than wholly inclined to all evil. If Calvinism is true, then at conception each person possesses a nature that is as evil as the nature of the devil. Now I realize that this does not disprove the doctrine, but it is a consequence of it. And if you're unprepared to accept that consequence, then you may need to rethink your belief in that particular doctrine. But let's go into some reasons as to why this doctrine is unscriptural. It is unscriptural, first of all, because it does not allow men to grow any worse in the scale of moral depravity. The scriptures teach that men go astray from birth, Psalms 58 and verse 3, and that they all turned aside, Psalms 14 and verse 3, and that evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13. But how can one who is born totally depraved, who is at birth wholly defiled in all faculties and parts of soul and body and utterly indisposed, disabled and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, how can such a one as this proceed from bad to worse? Or even turn aside? In fact, let me ask this question about turning aside. If a man is born with a nature as bad as the devil, which way would he go when he would go astray? Would they, he be going toward the devil or toward God? Well, i tell you something, dear friends. This doctrine would have them going toward God. 
That's what they would call going astray. How absurd and how blasphemous. The Westminster Confession and, and uh, of faith and the larger and shorter catechisms became over the years the doctrinal standard of the Presbyterian and other Reformed churches around the world. They teach men can't get any worse than what they are at birth. And if you doubt me, then once again let me ask, what word can be added to holy which would increase or intensify its meaning? As I said earlier, one cannot be more than utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite unto all that is spiritually good, and wholly inclined to all evil. One cannot be more than wholly defiled in all faculties and parts of soul and body. Such a person cannot proceed from bad to worse as the scriptures teach, and thus the confessions are wrong, and they ought to be repudiated by those who love the truth. But when the promoters of this doctrine are confronted with this truth, they attempt to preserve their doctrine by making a play on the word total. They claim that a man may be totally depraved and still become more crooked. According to Dr. James White, when we speak of total depravity, we are not in any way asserting that man is as evil as he could possibly be. And total depravity speaks to the condition and nature of man. Basically, this doctrine teaches that in all aspects of mankind's character, pardon me, it teaches that all aspects of mankind's character has been touched by sin. No part of man's nature has escaped the pollution of sin. Man's mind, man's heart, his emotions, our will, and every part has been altered, changed, or damaged by sin. The effect of sin's curse is total. And that's taken from his work, The Sovereign Grace of God, pages 47 and 48. So total does not refer to the degree of depravity, but to all the aspects of man's character. Man has some depravity scattered all through him, but he can grow worse. He is not as evil as he could possibly be. Well, Dr. White, this might do well as an, as an explanation. Were it not for some explanatory terms used in your creed, the London Confession of Faith, such as utterly indisposed, disabled and made opposite unto all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, chapter 6 and article 4. Certainly a sinner may go on sinning, but he can never grow any worse than he is here pictured in this Baptist confession of faith. Again, I say it ought to be repudiated. But another reason why this doctrine is wrong is because it is based upon the false doctrine that the sins of the Father can be passed on to his sons. God gave a command that Adam and his wife not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as we see in Genesis 2 and verse 17. But they did eat, and their rebellious act fits well the biblical definition of sin. Sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4, or it's the transgression of the law, as it says in the King James. The scriptures never define sin as anything but a transgression of law. It is never viewed as a weakness or something we inherit and the Spirit never calls temptation a sin. If this were the case, Jesus would be a sinner, for he has been tempted in all things as we are. Hebrews 4, verse 15. When Adam and Eve transgressed the law of God, uh, the guilt was imputed to them for that sin. They died spiritually. Those who believe that more than this happened, that the guilt of this transgression was also imputed to their children, and that in the same death and sin conveyed to all their posterity, well, they're obliged to prove it. And we are confident, I am confident, they will fail. For the scriptures teach, the person who sins, does lawlessness, will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, and then the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. And this is taught in Ezekiel 18, especially in verse 20. Though men often suffer as consequences of their father's sin, as we see in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, no man has or will ever be punished because of his father's sin, spiritually. Each man spiritually dies for his own sins, and he dies for his sins alone, as we see in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, and Colossians 2 and verse 13, Calvinism notwithstanding. Well, my time is up. I do hope to present another lesson on this issue quickly, and, uh, and I look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions. If you would like to respond to this, please, please do so. I think the truth has nothing to fear by honest investigation, and so I would like this debate to continue, this discussion to continue, because 
there's a lot involved. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time.